good morning, everyone. Uh, we should be live on YouTube now. Can someone give me an uh, indication in, the, in Discord in the Questions Lectures channel if you can hear my audio? Wonderful. Thanks very much. Uh, I make it 8.52. We'll go live with the lecture start in eight minutes. We'll start it right on nine o'clock. So until then, um, sit back and enjoy the service. And I'll see you in eight minutes time.
Well, I make it nine o'clock, so we uh, will get underway. I'll just check Discord one more time. Can someone give me a heads up in um, the questions lectures channel that you've got the audio coming through okay? Excellent. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, either Brenton or Sarah or both will be on Discord in the questions lectures channel. So um, if you've got questions on the fly as we work through the lecture, please post them there. Um, welcome everyone, Monday week three. Um, think back to where we've, where we've been in the last couple of weeks. Uh, after our introduction to the course, we really started uh, to, get, to get our hands on some Python code last week. A week ago, uh, we looked at importing some external functionality through uh, modules and external functions. And so we used a, a trigonometric function from the math library to do that. We also introduced plotting, producing graphs and um, printing, displaying numbers using a, um, using a precise format, should we, should we want that. And last Thursday, we introduced data types. So we introduced the integer data type, the float data type, and also the string data type. Um, and we also introduced arrays. Um, there's more to come with arrays. The arrays that we looked at last Thursday were what are known as one-dimensional arrays. And they're, they're certainly powerful enough for us to solve interesting problems, and we're going to use a couple of them today. Uh, but there's more to come on arrays. So we've got importing, we've got plotting, we've got printing, we've got data types, we've got arrays. One common feature of all the programs we've written today, uh, to date rather, is that they operate in a strictly sequential fashion. So your programs run top to bottom, uh, one line after another, each line executed once and each line executed exactly once. And, and, and using that, we're able to solve a lot of interesting problems. And the ingredients that we've seen over the past couple of weeks will be the really the foundational building blocks that we'll use for the remainder of the course. But they're also limited, um, what we've seen to date, because what computers are really good at is doing uh, computations really quickly. And so in solving engineering problems, we often find ourselves needing to execute code many times over. And the focus of today's lecture is giving you the three building blocks that Python provides in order to execute code um, conditionally, meaning that we're going to execute code iteratively multiple times over. And I'll show you a couple of ways of, of doing that on the, on the lecture overview slide that you see here. We're going to introduce the two way, the two primary ways that Python provides the ability to execute code multiple times. They're called loops, and there are two types of loops in Python. One's called a for loop, one's called a while loop. One's not better than the other. They've got each of them's got um, application depending on the nature of the problem, and I'll show you problems today that use both those types of, of iteration. The third topic that I want to cover with you today is what's known as conditional execution or branching. Sometimes we'd like to be able to have the feature where uh, code is only executed if a particular condition is satisfied. Um, and if, if, an, if a condition is not satisfied, then we'd like to skip over that code. Maybe it's not relevant. Uh, and so what you see on the lecture, over slide, the lecture overview slide there in front of you are really the three building blocks that are able to give us the ability to write programs that, are, that really super, supercharge our, our coding um, capability. Writing programs that work iteratively and writing code that executes conditionally, depending on conditions that, are, that arise during the operation of the code. So the first type of iteration I want to discuss with you is what's called a for loop. And now all programming languages have certain loop structures because uh, what computers of all types share in common is the ability to execute code quickly. And so being able to do a simple task many times um, in a second 
um, gives a computer enormous power. Um, and I'm talking about executing instructions thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times in a second or more. And so that allows us to do uh, to solve enormously complicated problems by simply executing the same block of code many times over. And so Python provides two such, such structures, the for loop and the while loop. Um, and as I said before, then one's not better than the other. Sometimes a problem might lend itself to a solution with a particular st structure for or while. But generally speaking, with the problem that involves iteration, it's possible to use either, either structure. And I'm not going to preference one over the other. And what I'm going to do with you today is step you through um, the rudiments of being able to write uh, structured, uh, structured code that makes use of both these for and while loops. And uh, you'll find today that today's lecture is going to be quite uh, uh, hands on. It's going to be quite uh, um, look, quite a few live demos woven through the through the presentation, and I want to do that to to to, to bring out the, the the key ideas of of, of iteration and and to to give you a, a sense of the power of it. And so the first problem that we're going to solve is we're going to print the five times table. And uh, before we write a script to do that, I'm going to do it with you on the console. Okay. On the console. So now we've seen the console, we've seen it for a couple of weeks now, we've starting to become familiar with it. Um, suppose we wanted to print the five times table. We know how to use the print statement. We saw that a couple of weeks ago, or uh, last week, week before last. What we could do is print out we want to print two numbers. We want to print, for example, one times five is five, two times five is 10, three times five is 15, four times five is 20, and so on. So we want to display two numbers. We want to be able to display one number times five is equal to another number. And then we use the the format statement and the two numbers we want to display are in the first instance one remember I said the first line of our times table is one times five is five so we want so if we want to not not uh, we want to we want to say the first number is one and the second number is one times five we print that and it prints this, the message here that you see highlighted in blue one times five is five Good. That's the first line of our of our uh, of our times table. If I want to print two times five is five, I want to execute the same line of code, except now I want to use two times five is two times five. Print two times five is ten. So remember this 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 idea that we've got these placeholders, the the the, the, the curly parentheses, and then we've got two of them, two placeholders in our in our in our message string the first one is replaced by the number the first argument to the format function the second number is replaced by the second uh, argument to the format function third line no surprise this time it's going to be three times three times five is 15. so the only calculations that python's doing for us here are the ones that are indicated in the second argument to the, of the format function the one with the multiplication and we could continue. I'll do one more for good luck. Four times five is 20. Great. Now that's all well and good. It doesn't solve the original problem that we had, which was to write a program to do that for us. I'm doing it at the, at the console to begin with. And the reason for that is I want you to see the, the essence of what's going on with this problem is that we've got the same line of code that's being executed. The only difference between these successive lines of, of Python code are the arguments to the format function. The first one was one, 
one times five, two, two times five, three, three times five, four, four times five. So what we'd like is the ability to run this code once and instead of having to hardwire or hard code in the number of one, two, three, or four, what we'd like is the ability to, uh, to do that with Python doing the work for us. That's the motivation for what we'll call the for loop that you see coming up. So let me just break out of this and go back to the screen. So our motivation was to print the five times table at the console. What you see on the screen there now is a, uh, on the left, you'll see some Python code that I wrote in a, uh, not at the console, but in a, a Python program that I call times table 5x on the left. On the right hand side, you see the output. So if I was to run that program, it's got 10 lines of code in it. What you see is on the right hand side. You see the, 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 the five times table displayed for you. And so you can see that the, the essence of that program is really quite straightforward. It's one template of code that's repeated 10 times. What would happen if we wanted to run from using this format from not one times five or up, up to 10 times five, but maybe 100 times five? Well, using the model on the left, we'd have to have 100 lines of code in our program. And obviously that's going to be inefficient. So that motivates for us using a, a, a for loop. And using a for loop, we can replace 10 lines of code with just two lines. The two lines are, the first line is if the first time we've seen the, uh, what's known as a for loop in Python. And the second line is the print statement. You'll see there's a little bit of extra stuff in the print statement because uh, the textbook is being a bit more prescriptive about the format of the, of the display. So there's a little bit of content inside the place markers, but it's not, that's not important here. Just think about this statement on the second line as being um, just a repetition of what we saw on the console a moment ago. Print place marker times five is equal to the place marker. And here's the key. On the right hand side, we've got the format statement where instead of a number, and a number as being passed in as the arguments to the format function, we've got a variable i. And that i in the first line of this for statement is running over this list of numbers indicated in the square in the square brackets. One up to ten. So that's a lot more convenient. Um, we could we can replace ten lines of code with just two. We'll improve that. Um, shortly in a moment but this is the this code that you see on on the screen in front of you now is the uh is the first example of a for loop you'll see another couple of things that are going to be common themes in today's lecture we need to be really careful we know already from your experience um in, in programming that uh details matter when it comes to writing programs and there's two details I want to draw your eye to in, on, the, on this slide here. First is that at the end of the statement that begins for I in, the, 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 the numbers, 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 you'll see a colon at the end. That colon is, needs to be there. It's part of the language definition. It's part of the definition of the for statement. It needs to be there. The second thing I want to draw your eye to in this code fragment is the indentation you'll see in the print statement. You see, it says for i equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten colon. It drops down to the second line and then the print statement appears. You'll see the print statement's been shifted in a number of spaces. In this case, it's been shifted in four spaces. That indentation is not just to make the code look nice, it's a necessary part of the Python for statement. So it's part of the language definition. So it's, it's, it's white space, what's called white space. It's just um, spaces typed at your keyboard. But it's not there just to make the code look good. It's there by necessity. 
Why is it there by necessity? Because what the for loop does, it will repeatedly execute everything that's been indented for every value of the for loop variable i. So the reason this code fragment that you see on the screen here can replace 10 lines of code with just two lines is that the first line sets up the for loop. The second line is what's going to be executed multiple times. And in fact, it's going to be executed once for every value of the index in this list. And the indentation is the way of telling Python, here's the stuff that I want you to, to, to um, execute iteratively. And we're going to see examples later today where we want not just one statement to be executed iteratively, but multiple statements. That's also possible in Python, provided all those lines are indented. So for each line that's indented, the value of print is called. So this is really powerful, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but it bears repeating. Um, it's the first time we've seen in this course iteration. And what that means is, even though the, line, the, the, the call to the print the, the print function only occurs once in the code, it's executed multiple times. It's executed once for every value of the index in this list. So let's let's actually let's actually do that, shall we, in um, at the console, just to demonstrate it live for you. Okay, so all I'm going to do is type in the code for i in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, colon. Did you notice what happened when I press return at the end of the, after the colon? The console automatically does the intent indentation for me. So the console's been written in such a way that when it sees a for statement, it knows that what's going to come are the lines to be executed iteratively. So it's it's really helping you write the write write code, print, use the same format as we did before, placeholder times five is equal to placeholder, and now we want to display the two numbers, and this time. The numbers aren't one, one times five, two, two times five, they're i and i times five, where i is gonna take the value for each number in the, in the loop. So the first number to be displayed is i, the second is i times five. Return, return, and, then, and it runs for us. And in, in those two lines of code, we've produced the, the, um, the, the times table. The, the, the previously took 10 lines of, of code or, or 10 lines at the console. So that's really powerful. Um, personally, uh, whenever I find myself writing iterative loops, even simple ones like this, I tend to not use the console, but I use a, a program to bring up the editor and write a program, even if it's a two or three line program. That's just a habit I've got into. But nonetheless, the Python console here will actually um, do the indentation and it does this and it indicates it with some dotted some dot dot dots to indicate that it knows the code's being indented. So that's I think that's quite that's quite handy. Um, although as I say, I personally don't um, use it at the console much. For teaching it was handy, but um, I'd usually write myself a small program. And in fact, I did. Uh, no, I didn't do it. Didn't write the program there. I actually the console was good enough. Okay, so that we've we've seen our first our first loop. It's about as simple as a for loop gets. Um, a single variable running over a short list and a single line of code that executes, and the only computation that's being done is this multiplication by five. Otherwise, it's it's a print statement. So it's about as simple as a for loop gets, but nonetheless, I think very um, illustrative. In general, though. Here's what a typical for loop um, looks like. Uh, 
think we'll get to see yeah, we'll get to see some more uh, complicated examples in later in today's lecture. But this is like a, a template, if you like. And so the structure of a, a, a typical for loop is for a loop variable. In this, in our previous example, that loop variable was i, a variable i, uh, in some numbers. In this case, some numbers is a um, a, a list of numbers that we want the we want the um, loop variable to run over. Then you'll see code lines one, two, dot, 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 and they're all, all indented. So the indentation here, as I said before, is a way of Python bracketing together a block of codes that a block of code that's executed um, um, for each value of the, the loop variable. And you could write a hundred lines of code, provided they're all been indented, then Python knows that that line of code is to be executed um, as part of the block of statements defined in the for loop. How do you, how do you indicate when the, the for loop's finished? No problems. You go back and you remove the indentation. So this last line, it's a comment, comment indicated with a, an opening character hashtag, um, first line after the loop. That's the way that uh, you indicate to Python that the iteration is to stop and the code after the iteration is to then pick up. Um, I have to say in my experience that the use of indentation to indicate uh, the begin and end of a block of code that's repeated iteratively, in my experience, the use of indentation is unique in Python. I no doubt there'll be other languages in which it occurs, but usually in other programming languages, some sort of begin and end parentheses uh, are used to, to, to indicate the, um, the beginning end of those block of codes. So we've got the loop header, we've got indentation, we've got a block of statements and the, the statements collectively are called the loop body. Um, the block of code inside a loop must be indented. I've said that multiple times now. Um, the indentation is uh, four spaces. That's not a rule that's embedded in Python language. One space would work, two spaces would work, 10 spaces would work, but it's by convention. Convention's another way of saying it's by agreement. Um, personally, I find that uh, four spaces is, is the right uh, amount of indentation. It's easy for your eye to see that, the, that there's a code block there. Um, any less than that, and it's difficult to see which code's being iteratively executed and which is not. Any more than that, um, and it gets a bit a bit awkward. The code jumps across eight spaces, eight spaces. It's a bit it's a bit odd, um, but it is only a, a, a convention. Uh, PyCharm Py by default uses four spaces, and I'm very happy with that. And, and again, once the indentation's reversed, namely after the indentation's removed, and we go back to the first line of code, the loop body has ended. So. It's possible in, in Python to execute what are called nested loops. I won't demonstrate one of these today. We'll hold that off for another day, but I do want to alert you to it um, at this point because it, it really highlights for you the role that indentation plays in marking out the begin and end of, of blocks. So with a nested loop, for each iteration of a loop, and I'm not sure I've used that terminology before, but each pass through the indented block is called an iteration. In a nested loop, inside each iteration, we can execute another loop, one nested inside the other, like those Russian dolls. One happens inside another, and if we want, we can put that one in another, in another one. So for a, a, a pair of nested loops, we need two levels of indentation. So again, this is what I, the one I want to demonstrate for you here. I'm not going to run through it in detail. We'll hold off the use of nested loops and, until later in the course, but there's nothing magical about them. You know how to write them after today's lecture. So here you see um, two for loops, nested for loops. So let's look carefully at the code. In the first line of code, we've got for i equals one, two, and three. Inside there, we print i is equal to, we print the number i. The line, the, the next line is for j is equal to four, five, six. 
Notice that it's 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. Remember in Python what that designates? Designates the, the, the variables inside that list, inside that, inside that list, they're actually floating point numbers. So that's another lesson that comes from this, from this slide here, namely that the, the loop variable doesn't have to be an integer, it could be a floating point number. That's handy. So what this loop does, and it's probably best illustrated if you look at the output of the code at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that um, for each value of i, one, two, and three, the value of j being 4.0, 5.0, 6.0 is displayed. So the, the, the outer loop involves the loop variable i, the inner loop involves the, the loop variable j. And so for each iteration of the outer loop, namely for i equals one, we just print the three values. Why? Because the, the only statement that's inside the, the, the second nest is to print the value of j. Remember the, the this the information that happens in the in the within the placeholder here is not particularly relevant to this slide, but if you're worried about it, this colon point one f, we touched on, we looked at that last week as part of the, the printing, um, it's part of Python's uh, controlled display of a floating point number. Okay, so that's the only statement inside the second level of indentation. And then after we've after we've printed j equals four, j equals five, j equals six, we drop back to the outer level, the first level of indentation, display i equals two, and then do it do the inner loop again, i equals three, do the inner loop again. It turns out that nested loops, and in particular this type of two levels of nested loops, work really well when we've got two-dimensional arrays, where we're, for example, um, processing um, images. Um, last week we looked at one dimensional arrays, we'll get to two dimensional arrays in a few weeks time, but whenever we've got to operate over two dimensions, one horizontal, one vertical, uh, nested loops like this are really handy because what it means is we can set up a loop that runs over every single pixel in an image, for example. We run over, for each row, we run across each column. Once we finish the first row, we drop down to the second row and go through each each column and doing that where we process a whole image. So nested loops are possible. Um, the takeaway message from this slide is that if we're gonna use two levels of nesting, we need two levels of indentation. If you look at the code, indented four, four spaces and then indented eight for the, for the inner level of indentation. Okay, so far our loop, our for loop has not been um, especially powerful. All it's done is print some numbers. Let's get, let's get Python to do some work for us. We saw last week that uh, we could define arrays. And if you remember, we looked at a, um, an example of the, the vertical, the height of a ball above the ground. And we used arrays to, to capture the information in the time axis, but also the height axis. So we've seen arrays before, one dimensional arrays. Arrays have the feature that they they use uh, they use uh, index indices indexes to to specifically pick out the elements of the array and I've indicated them here in this in this example where we want suppose we want to compute the average of five numbers so you can see there's a formula in the middle of the screen if we want to compute the average of five numbers we need to add those five numbers together. Those numbers are represented in the array variables h0, h1, h2, h3, and h4. And then we divide by the number of variables. It turns out that the for loop and arrays are a really natural combination. So the pattern of code that I'm gonna display for you here at the bottom of slide eight is a really common one in coding, where we use a for loop to set up a loop variable which runs from, in this case, zero up to four. And then we use the value of the, for, of the loop variable inside a loop to do some mathematical operation. In this case, we're using the for loop variable 
to, to run through the, the indices of an, uh, of an array. And then as we run through the, 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 uh, the, the array in the, in the for loop, we compute a running sum of the numbers. So if I ask you to add up the numbers, if I ask, well, let me step back. If I ask you to compute the average of five numbers, you'd need to add those five numbers together and then divide by five. That's the definition of an average. So what you do, if you really break that, that down, if you wanna add five numbers, keeping in mind that um, computer programming languages really only support um, simple operations done repeatedly. In order to compute the sum, you take H0, you'd add to it H1. To that running sum, you'd add H2. To that running sum, you'd add H, H3. And to that running sum, you'd add H4. And when you've added those five numbers together, H0, H1, H2, H3, and H4, then you finish the loop and you can divide by five and the code's executed. So if we look down here at the at this fragment of at this code rather at the bottom of the page, I want to highlight a, a several things to you. Um, let's look first. Let's look. Uh, let, let's look first. Let's run from the top. We set up a variable n is equal to five. That's the number of values uh, that we're going to average. The, the, the second, or in fact, the third line of code here. The first line of code is to import the NumPy. Um, library. We've seen this input NumPy as MP. We've, we've seen that before. That allows us to use um, elements of the, um, the NumPy uh, library. And the, the, the function that we want to access inside NumPy this time is in this line of code that says h equals np.0s n. And the zeros function, if you recall from last week, uh, creates an array and fills it with zeros. So there's a really good question in Discord chat last week about why would you ever want an array of zeros? Almost always because you want to create the array and then fill it with zero, fill it with numbers that are of more interest than just zeros. And so sure enough, you see here on the, the fourth line of code, here are the, the five numbers that are um, that are inserted into the array that's been defined in the third line of code. So the h equals np.0s n, that creates the array fills it with zeros. The next line of code down fills in what those values are. H0 is equal to 1.60, meaning the number 1.6, the floating point number that goes is 1.6, it gets stored in element H0 of, of the array H. Likewise, H1 takes the number 1.85, H2 is 1.75 and so on. And the example that's taken from the textbook are that these five numbers are the, are the heights in meters of five members of a family. There's actually one other small feature of the language um, that's illustrated here in this code where the, the elements H0 through H4 are defined. Uh, it's the use of the semicolon here. I haven't explicitly called this out before. It's possible in Python to uh, execute multiple instructions on a single line of um, code by separating them with a semicolon. So this semicolon here is a separator that separates distinct instructions, but uh, enables them to be done on a single line of code. I, as a general rule, when I'm writing code, I like to have one instruction per line. This is the sort of example where I would break that sort of that my convention. It's a personal programming convention. It's not a rule. And the reason is that we don't really want to have five lines of code to fill it. We don't necessarily want five lines of code that fill in the values of that array. Um, we, we, we really just want to define the, the values and then get on with doing the computation. So it doesn't, wouldn't really make sense to stretch the code out and have all those um, uh, uh, assignment statements on a separate line, but no, it's not a big deal. What is a big deal? What is a big deal is the code that you see at the towards the bottom of this, uh, this slide here. You'll see a for loop that, start, that says for i equals zero, one, two, three, four. Also finishes with a colon because that's part of the definition of the for statement. Uh, the, what we're doing in this for loop, we're setting up the loop variable i to be an index into the array. And the index needs to run 
according to the red numbers that you see on the formula in the middle of the screen. The loop variable needs to run from zero to one, to two, to three, to four. The indentation, remember that's a key part of the for loop. The indentation says sum is equal to sum plus hi. So what sum is, is what's called a running sum. It's going to add up the numbers as we progressively work along the uh, the elements of the array. We need to keep a track of what the sum of the numbers are is up to and including the element we've reached. So that running sum is added to each time, each iteration of the loop, the sum is equal to sum plus hi. But notice something careful. I've skipped over, deliberately, I've skipped over something that's really important. Before the for loop, we needed to initialize sum to be equal to zero. Because what we're saying is at the start, before we start adding any numbers, our running sum is equal to zero. So inside the loop, inside the indentation, the, the line of code that's executed is sum is equal to sum plus hi. That says, the, the, uh, do it, do it, do it. I want you to think about it, what's going on. For the first iteration of this loop, i takes the value zero. We're gearing up to do something with array element h zero. The first time we run through this loop, we're going to say sum is equal to sum plus h zero. Up until that point, the value of the running sum itself should be zero because we've got we've had no numbers to add so far. So we we iterate through the, the five iterations of the loop for the five members of the family. Member zero, member one, member two, member three, member four, representing their heights, H0, H1, H2, H3, H4, and H4. We add them up. Once we've added them all and we've got the running sum, we've computed the numerator of the expression on the middle of this slide. We then need to divide by five. And so the second last line of code here is that the average of them is equal to the sum divided by n. And remember that n was the was the number that we um we chose. There's one actually, there's one very subtle um, piece of uh, code, good coding practice that's embedded in this, in, this, uh, in this example. You might ask yourself, why would I introduce the variable n, the five? It's only really used in one place. That's not true. It's actually used in two places. It's actually used in the definition of the the creation of the array H, so this number N here, says how many elements of the array do we want to create? And it's also used in computing the average as being the sum divided by N. It would have been possible for such a small program to define our array as being HP.N0's, NP.0's five, and then average is equal to sum divided by five. Um, it's much preferable to replace them with the value of the variable n uh, or a variable because what we're really doing is we're setting the code up to be later should we want to enhance that code to incorporate a larger family more than five members we only have to change the variable five in the definition of the n the assignment of the n's to, to n so what that means is we avoid the appearance of these um numbers that are peppered through our code like np.0 is five and average is equal to sum divided by five. Numbers when they occur like that without any explanation, they're sometimes called magic numbers. Um, and magic numbers are not a good thing. Uh, as a general rule in programming, you try and avoid um, programs serve two purposes. One, they're instructions to computers, but they're also ways of capturing um, ideas and conveying them to fellow programmers. So. That code there will actually compute the average of, of, our, of our five numbers there. So it's great. Let's do it. Let's have a look at the average height function. What you'll notice um, from time to time, and this is one such time, um, I'm going to start embedding links in here um, to the Python code. 
which enables me to share code that I'm demonstrating in lectures. I'll be able to share it with you um, and, and you can access it yourself. So this average height.py is actually, if you hover the mouse over, it's actually um, a link to a, to a URL. So let me do it. It'll bring up, um, it'll bring up a, a, a web page where I can take that code, copy it, and then paste it to the console and it runs. So that's nice. What we could have also done with the, with the program is uh, copy it, go to, um, go back to PyCharm, create a Python file. Let's just give it some name, paste the code, and then we've, we've saved it for, late, for later use. Um, right now, I don't want to talk too much about um, where this, this, this particular uh, web page is. Uh, that's, it's, it's actually provided by the textbook. It's actually a, um, it's an external uh, platform known as GitHub. And I definitely want to run through with you uh, how to use GitHub. Uh, both how to access code, but also how to create your own. Um, this is a way of being able to store code and data in the cloud. Um, GitHub's got many, many features that allow multi large programming teams to be able to store programs, uh, share programs, uh, make revisions to code and then step them back to say, oh, look, my program's now got a bug, but I know it worked last week. Let me go back to an old revision. I don't want to work through that with you now, but I just want to point out that there is a thing called GitHub uh, and we will use it later in the course, just not today. So I gave you a live demo then of uh, the, the program. Let's, here's our, here's our program. That's exactly the code that came from the, the lecture slide. And now if I run that code, what they call it test two, an awful name, I run it and uh, it computes the average height here of the, the members of the family. So if I want to uh, change the value of a, a family member's height, I realize oh, I've made a measurement error. Go back and change their height to 1.7, run the code again. The average will come down. It was one point something and now it's 1.47 meters. Um, so that's, that's because we've written, a, um, written a, a script, a program instead of done it at the, at the command line. So here you can see, the two lines highlighted in blue are the for loop. We compute the running sum. What we can also do then is if we, if we run that at the console, here's the code, remember I cut and paste and ran it straight in the console, cut and paste from GitHub, copied it into the console. Um, what we could actually do is print the value of sum. That's the running sum. So the, remember the interpretation of sum, it's the, it's the sum of the, all the heights of the family members, 1.6, 1.85, 1.75, 1.8, and 0.5. If we print the value, it's 7.5. And so the, the, the computation that's done in this program is to compute the sum divided by the value of n, five family members, and it prints out 1.5 meters. So that's really that's that's really nice. That's it. That's the first use of um, the first use of, of a for loop that we'll that we'll see, and it's a really common programming um, template, which is to which is to couple up the use of for loops and arrays. They go together like. Um, uh, two, two very natural, they, they, they work together really naturally because often with arrays, uh, you want to access either some or all of the elements individually and for loops allow us to do that. So that's really powerful. However, there's also a, there's also a, um, uh, a, a real limitation in the code that we've seen so far. 
uh, done deliberately because I wanted to be introduce this in, in stages for you. But there's a real problem in our code. Uh, let me go back up to our very first example, our first loop. There's a real problem with this code in that, um, yes, we replaced 10 lines of code with just two lines. Fantastic. In order to do that, we had to explicitly write out the numbers that we wanted the loop variable to range over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's mildly inconvenient if we want to uh, access 10 elements of an array. But what about 100? What about 1,000? What about 10,000? If you ever found yourself writing the numbers out from 0 to 9,999 in a, in, a, in a program, you've made a mistake. You're not using the full power of, of the programming language. You're not even close. So we want some way of being able to automatically generate um, a list of numbers, not by specifying the individual numbers themselves, but for um, uh, but by by but by using a, a, a an external a, a function, and there's a built-in function in Python called range, and it solves this problem. Instead of having for i equals um, zero, one, two, three, four, we can use the we can use the, the function call for i is in range zero, five, one. Now I've got the I've got the general syntax of the call to range at the bottom of the screen. But just look at what's happened. We've replaced uh, for i equals for i in the range uh, for i in in this, the list zero one two three four. We've replaced that for i for i in range zero five one. And the the general form is to start at the first argument, increment by in this case one, the final argument in the call to range, and that we stop before we get to the the, uh, the, 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 the the second argument in the range. You might ask, why not specify the last element rather than um, stopping before it? I don't know, it's a feature of Python and we just have to deal with it. So let me demonstrate that for you live at the console. Let me start. Let me start. By, by saying for i um, in, let me do it first. Let me go back one, two, three, four, five, uh, four, colon, indents for us. That's nice. Let's just print the value of i. Okay, so it prints zero to four. That's good. Let's now use the same code except replace the explicit list with a call to range. So remember the arguments to range are the starting index is the first is the first index, it's the first argument. The increment is the final index. So we're going to count up by one. You can also count down, but in this case we're going to count up. And we stop before we get to five. Namely, we're going to stop at four. So let's print that now. and a printer for us. So what I've done, you can see on the screen here now, highlighted in blue, I've got two equivalent uh, uh, uses of Python, one of which is a for loop, which has the loop explicitly, the loop variable explicitly. The second one uses the call to range. The second form is so much more flexible. Suppose we want to display not the numbers from zero to to five, but the numbers from zero to 100. Because we want to stop at 100, um, we're, going to, we're going to use the, the argument um, 101, because remember, we stop before we reach that, that index there. And there, we've just printed the numbers. You've got to scroll back to see them, because they've been displayed one per, one per, per line, but it happened pretty quickly. If I wanted to do that, have that functionality using this explicit form of the for loop, I'd have to actually type out the numbers up to 100. But we can use the same code now. Let's go up to 1,000. Boom, 
we've just printed out the numbers from um, zero to a thousand. So that's super powerful. The call, the, the, the range function is really, is really powerful. Let's, for good measure, let's go, let's suppose we want to count up from zero to a thousand in steps of two instead of one. Look at that, it's done it for us. It's gone up in indices. The indices here now go up in, in steps of two. And we can go up by multiples of three, for example. Um, how good's that? So the range function is uh, is really is really is really powerful, um, and you'll have an opportunity in the um, in this week's uh, if not this week's then next week's um, lab sheet to be able to use that range function. So that's that's really that's really powerful. So that's that's really good news. We've now got the ability to do things in Python that we've not been able to do before. If we couple together the ability to write for loops over large numbers of indices and then couple that with the ability to access arrays with large numbers of elements in them, then we're able to do repeated calculations um, and, and solve interesting problems for, enge for engineering. So that's really powerful. This is uh, all the ingredients that we've seen in, 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 in the course to date have been fundamental building blocks. Plotting, printing, external functions, data types and arrays, but we've really supercharged it now by, by, with the ability to execute code iteratively. I said there were two, there were two forms of uh, iteration uh, that, that occur commonly in, in programming. And and therefore in Python. And the first one is a while loop. And I'm gonna introduce the second one for you um, now, and it's called a while loop. The characteristic feature of a for loop is that it runs for a specified number of iterations. So for example, when we computed the average of the family members, the average height of the family members, there were five of them. We knew that in advance. Um, if we wanted to display uh, the, the multiples of three up starting at zero and no more than a thousand, um, we know what the upper limit is. In this case, it was a thousand. It's not always the case that when we iterate, we know how many operations we want to, how many, how many times we want to iterate through a loop. Sometimes the number of times we want to execute a block of code is not known in advance, but we want to do it while ever some condition is true. And so the second type of loop construction that's provided by Python is called a while loop. And a while loop runs for as long as a condition is true. Not until we've exhausted all the array um, or all the, the loop variables from through the list, but for as long as a condition is true. So that and that raises the question, what do, we, what do I mean by conditions in Python? And how do we decide if a condition is true or if it's not true, if it's false? They're really good questions. And we're just gonna take a little, a little detour now to answer these questions. How do we write conditions in Python? What does it mean to write conditions in Python? And how do we decide if a condition is true or false? And we need to answer these questions because unlike the for loop that runs a for a specified number of iterations, the while loop is going to run while ever these things called conditions are true. Now these conditions, we touched on them at the end of um, week one, but I want to take a slightly closer look now. Not an exhaustive look, a fairly quick look, but enough to get us to do useful things. It's often the case in solving engineering problems that we need to check whether something's true or not and to take action accordingly. Maybe we're simulating uh, a bridge and we want to simulate uh, what happens if, uh, if a truck rolls across the bridge. Maybe we want, to, we want to take some action with our simulation program if the, if the, if the mass of the truck is less than 30 tonnes. Um, maybe we're simulating a, a chemical reactor and we want to, we want to check some, uh, what happens if a pH in a tank is above, above 10. Uh, they're two examples of 
an unlimited number from from an engineering setting where we a, a, a condition something is less than something something is above something um that's what i mean by conditions more rigorously um what i'm introducing here what are known as logical expressions or boolean expressions and logical or boolean expressions and i'll use those terms interchangeably they mean the same thing um they're expressions which take very particular values. In fact, they only take two values, one of either, either true or false. So we've seen variables so far that have taken integer values, float values, string values. Now we're introducing a new type of variable. Well, we will need to introduce a new type of variable because we're evaluating expressions that don't take integer values, don't take floating point values, that don't take string values, but they take the values true and false. And those true and false values are known as Boolean values. And um, when I write true and false in this course, I'm going to use upper and uppercase T and uppercase F. That's because I'm, because I'm talking about something very precise. I'm not just saying true and false, I'm saying it takes the Boolean value true. It takes the Boolean value false. And Boolean values can only take values true and false. There's no in between. There's no if, buts, and maybes. They are either true or they're false. So when we're making decisions about, about quantities, these conditions that are going to be the, the ingredients that set up our while loop, we need to be able to compare two quantities. We want to be able to say something less than something is something greater than something? Is something greater than or equal to something? Is one quantity equal to another quantity? Or is one quantity not equal to another quantity? So these expressions that we're talking about are actually known as relational operators. And they allow us to compare values in Python. So they have the symbols that are indicated at the bottom of the screen here, greater than and less than, they'll be familiar to you from, from high school. Likewise, greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, except in Python, we need to be able to represent those uh, greater than or equal to and less than or equal to using uh, characters that come from the keyboard. So greater than or equal to is indicated with a greater than sign immediately followed by an equals. And less than or equal to is indicated by a less than symbol and an equals. So that's four of the six. Greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. What about the last two? If we want to compare two values, we want to say something, we want to check, is something equal to another thing? We can't use the equals symbol in Python because that, the equals symbol you'll remember from last week is we, what, what we use for assignment. So when we write x equals x plus four, what we mean is x is assigned the value of x plus four, namely x is incremented by, by four. But when we're checking for equality, we need to use a different symbol. So we can't use the equals. So what Python does is uses two equals symbols next to each other. So that allows us to compare one quantity with another and say, are they equal to each other? Is the number of people in the family equal to five? The other relational operator, the final one of six, is the not equal to. And that's indicated by the exclamation mark in an equal symbol. So is the number of family members not equal to five? So they're the relation op operators and they're the only ones that we, could, that we need, that we have in Python. So let's demonstrate those live at the console. So we're going to define a variable x and it's going to take the value four. Remember I and I've already been I've already used precise language there. I'm not saying x equals four, I'm saying x is assigned the value of four. So there it is. Um, we, we can print it out if we like. Four. Butte. What I'm about to type in at the prompt here. 
and I'm going to highlight it in blue before I press return, is the expression x is greater than 5. What's the value of x? 4. Is x greater than 5? No. So when we type that at the console, what answer do you think we're going to get? x has got the value 4. So x is greater than 5 is actually a Boolean expression. It's a logical expression. It's not true. x is not greater than 5. x is equal to 4. If it's not true, it must be false. So when we type that in at the console, Python tells us that the answer is false. So what we've seen here, x is greater than 5, is the very first logical expression or Boolean expression. We're going to be able to do things with those later, but at the moment, I just want to illustrate them for you. What about is x is greater than or equal to 5? That's also false because x has got the value 4. X is not greater than or equal to 5, so that value, that expression is also false. What about X is less than 5? Well, X is 4, so X is certainly less than 5. And so we've got true. So now we've seen our first two Boolean expressions, first two logical expressions, that take the value either true or false. What about X is less than or equal to 5? Well, yes, it is. It's got the value 4. So we expect that to be, to be true. Okay. What about x is equal to 4? That's different from me saying x is assigned the value of 4. I'm using the double equals here now. The double equals is our way of saying, check for me whether the left-hand side takes the same value as the right-hand side. And we get true. So there's, four, there's five of our six relational operators. Greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, equality. And the only one that's left is x not equal to four. We have a double negative here. It's not, not equal to four because it's equal to four. So that statement must be false. Wow, that's good. There are building blocks. Expressions being compared with one another through one of six relational operators. We can continue though, because we can combine simple expressions and we can make more complicated expressions. So what about this one? What about X is less than five? and x is greater than three. How about that? Is that true? X has still got the value four. Let's just check. Let's print x. X has got the value four. So x is less than five and x is greater than three. Both those statements are true. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be absolutely clear here and use parentheses to group these expressions together. It's not necessary, but it's good coding practice. X is less than five is true. X is greater than three is true. So we've got two statements that are both true. So if we combine them with the with this expression, this operator and, we would expect that also to be true. So that's the first use of this logical operator, a Boolean operator called AND. Okay. What about X is equal to five? Is that true? Mm -mm. That's not true because X is equal to four. Or X is equal to four. Is that true? Is the expression that I've highlighted here true? Yes, it is. X has got the value four. So now we've got two expressions, one of which is false, one on the left, one of which is true, one on the right. The OR operator 
is going to be true when at least one of the expressions is true. So that's also true. So and means that all the expressions have to be true in order for the output to be true. Or means that at least one of the expressions has to be true in order for it to be true. They could both be true, but at least one of them has to be. Now we know that x is equal to four. We know that, that's true. We can also say not x is equal to four and that's false. So another way of saying that is not true is equal to false and not false is equal to true. Wow. So what we've done here is we've we looked at the the relational operators to compare the values. We again gave a live demo of those six relational operators, and then we gave a live demo of the combining those um, Boolean expressions using and, or, and not. Um, along the way, what we actually did was introduce a new variable type that's going to join the ones. Remember I said last week, I said you had to hold your, maintain your suspense for the new variable type that we're going to introduce in Python. It's called the Boolean variable type. So we've already seen int, float, an SDR string, and then we've got a new type, which is bool or Boolean. And we've already seen through a couple of examples here how, how these true and false expressions can be combined using these operators and or and not. Now, we did briefly touch on Boolean operators towards the end of the week one Thursday lecture. Uh, if you want to see a few more details, you can go back and review that lecture. Now you've seen how to get your hands on Boolean variables in, in Python. But I'm actually not going to go back and review it because we don't need it strictly for this course. So we're going to push on. Um, but what I would say is that these, uh, the, the rules which allow Boolean true and false expressions to be combined during using and or and not, they're covered in much more depth in the course of like 1710 that Sarah Johnson, my colleague here that's working with us to deliver this course. Sarah's teaching elect 1710, computer engineering in second semester. For those of you that need to know this stuff, it's done in a lot more detail. So I'm just skimming over the top, just giving you enough to be useful in this course. But there's a whole mathematical framework which then underpins the creation of digital logic devices. So there are billions and trillions of um, transistors made every day. What they do is process information using very structured forms of and, or, and not put together in um, the chips that run our computers and our mobile phones. I'm not gonna go through the details here. Um, some details in lecture, in week one Thursday lecture, but we've got enough to do useful stuff. So let's do some useful stuff. Our useful stuff is gonna, we're gonna actually look at an elaboration of a problem that we looked at last week. Do you remember last week we looked at a soccer ball and what we did was we gave it an initial vertical velocity and then we watched the height of the ball as time elapsed. And we gave the, the ball an initial impulse velocity vertically, at least with a vertical component. Uh, and we followed the part, we followed the height of the ball for the first uh, one second of its flight. And uh, we, 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 and we did that in one millisecond intervals, 10 to the minus three, what, 0 0.001 second. I wanna go back and revisit and modify and expand on that example. What I'm going to do though is last week I said that the initial vertical velocity of the ball was five meters per second. So that's, we've given a ball a certain kick. Um, it's got a vertical um, component to its velocity. This time I'm going to modify the ball, modify this, this, the setup. I'm going to reduce the initial vertical velocity by 10%. Just you know, instead, of, instead of it being five meters per second vertically, it's going to be 4.5. 
And our goal is to comp compute how long the ball stays in the air. And you'll see why I've bumped the number down from five to 4.5. Because what I'm gonna do, and let me just skip two slides, slip one slide ahead. And I'm, I'll show you in a moment the code that generates the, the graph that you see on the screen there now before you. Uh, what you see, and it's a, it's a, this we did not see this in the example last week because of the parameter choice of the initial velocity. What you see on the screen there in front of you is the vertical, the vertical height, the height, vertical uh, position of the ball as a function of time. There's something characteristically different about that about that setup. Can you see what it is? Because we haven't kicked the ball as fast vertically. Now, if we track it for the first second, we actually find that the height goes negative. Now, obviously, physics would say that's not going to happen. The ball will bounce off the ground. But our computer simulation doesn't know about that. All it knows is that the ball follows a trajectory and that at some point the height goes negative. Computer problem doesn't say, computer doesn't say a problem. It'll tell us. Um, that the, the height goes negative and we'd have to say, ah, oh, okay, yeah, right, yeah, we need, to, we need to introduce some new physics into this problem and, and watch what happens when the ball bounces. I don't wanna do that. What I do wanna do is use Python, and we're gonna use a while loop, to compute the amount of time that the ball is in the air. And we're gonna do that by computing the arc that the ball would trace and finding the time at which the height changes from a positive height above ground to a negative height. Because if we can estimate that time, we've computed how long the ball stays in the air for. So without looking at the numbers, if we wanna solve the problem of how long the ball's in the air, we wanna compute the time until this blue curve intersects the green dashed line. We wanna find the smallest time t where the height is negative. Because the height, the height is negative for this last roughly half second of flight. Yeah, because we've simulated for one second at one millisecond intervals. I'll show you the code for it in a minute. I want to show you, I want to talk about the concepts before we look at the details. So our algorithm for, for, for calculating the, the amount of time the ball's in the air, our algorithm is to find the smallest t for which the height is negative because that'll be the first time that we've computed a height that's below zero. It's a little hard to see the detail here because the curve's been plotted with dots that, that Python then joins up. So what I'm gonna do now is show you uh, the same curve, except I'm gonna zoom in on what happens around here at the crossing point, And I'm gonna plot the curve uh, not with the lines joined up, but with a line marker that, that shows the point, the calculated point separately. Here it is. This is the ball crossing the, the ground level. So from the height being positive to the height being negative, and it happens at about 0.9 seconds. If we zoom in, it's probably something like 0.9175 or thereabouts. And you'll see that if we're estimating the time that the ball is in the air for, we want to estimate this crossing time. Now for us, for this problem, there's multiple ways of solving this problem, but the solution, the simplest solution, is to, is to estimate the time the ball's in the air for. We're going to compute it by, um, by computing, as I said before, the, the first time for which the, the height is negative. So we're actually going to compute it for this, this first point that's below ground level. Now you might say, yeah, but we can get a better answer by using a finer time step rather than one millisecond, go finer than that. I'd say, yes. You, you might say, ah, oh, we can get an even better answer by drawing a straight line between these two dots and estimating where the straight line intersects the ground. And I'd say, yes, you're right. Our answer at the moment is gonna be approximate, but it'll be correct within one millisecond. That's good enough for this problem. Don't worry about the numbers at the bottom of the screen at the moment, I'll talk about them in a moment. I want to give the idea that we're going to estimate the time the ball's in the air by computing the smallest time for where the height's negative. This is the code. 
So let's look at the full chunk of code and then I want to zoom in on the bit of code that, that does all the work. This is our entire program. And in some ways, it's the most complicated problem, the problem uh, code that I've, that I've demonstrated for you in this, um, in this course to date. It's got about a dozen lines of code or 15 lines of code. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not the two or three line programs we were looking at last week. It uses some external functions, a lot of which we've seen before. If you look at the first five lines of this code, you'll, you'll have seen all these five lines before except the second line of code says v0 is 4.5 last week the code was v0 equals equals 5. g acceleration due to gravity called the lin space we did quite a lot of work during that in lectures and and the the uh, the, the lab exercises remember this sets up an, an array t which then computes the time at one millisecond intervals out to one second so a thousand points um, in a time interval zero to one. The, four, the, four, the fifth line of code here, the y equals v0 t, v0 times t minus half gt squared. We've seen that before as well. It's a really subtle line of code. Remember it uses this idea, remember, do you remember the name of the concept we used? It was called vectorization. We've defined an array t, and now we compute y for all values of t. That's why when we, when we actually run this code, we actually get the height going negative because the code's got no idea no, of the significance of the, of the ground here. It just computes the, the height y for all the values of t in the, the array defined by the call to lin space. Okay, I'm gonna skip over the, the chunk of code in the middle and then look to the bottom. We look to the bottom, we're printing stuff, print time of flight, import from the matplotlib library plot y a statement to plot the green dashed line that's the ground level okay so at the start of the code we've got some initialization and the call to compute the height through vectorization at the bottom of the code we've got 10 or so lines of code which do printing and plotting okay all the action in this program really happens or the action that i want to focus your attention to is happening in the middle of the of the code here. It's this find index where the ball's approximately reached y is equal to zero. So let's zoom in on that now on slide 18. Find the index where the ball has approximately reached y is equal to zero. Y is zero is the ground level. This is the first time that we've seen uh, a while loop. And look at the way it's structured. The first line of that code is i is equal to zero. If you remember, i is going to be well, if i is going to be an index into the array y. And because Python uses what's called zero-based indexing, y zero relates to the, the the first element of the array y. Remember, we defined the array y by the call to the generate all heights in this vectorization. Okay. So at the point this code executes, the while loop, the heights y have been calculated. They're sitting there for us in a vector, ready to be processed. We know what happens if we plot them. We get a curve that looks like this. We want to find out the, we're trying to estimate where the ball crosses the ground. So the while loop, says that while yi is greater than or equal to zero, do something. So let's think about what the significance of y, yi greater than or equal to zero means. In words, it means if the height of the ball is greater than or equal to zero. Namely, in words, what this while loop is doing is saying while ever the ball is above the ground, in the simulation, do something. And again, in the while loop, you see here the use of indentation. The indentation tells us what we're gonna do while ever the ball is above the ground. So we use the index i, we're gonna initialize it at zero. We're interested in the heights y, 
but we're only interested in the heights because we want to estimate the time at which the height goes negative. We've got the height stored in the array Y, indexed Y0, Y1, Y2. We've got the times corresponding to those heights in the array T, indexed T0, T1, T2. And our loop runs for as long as the condition Y is equal to zero is satisfied. Notice that in the while loop, we've got a Boolean condition going on. We've got one of these relational operators greater than or equal to. So while ever the height is greater than or equal to the ground level, we do something. And the something that we do is to increment the index i, the loop index. We increment it by one. So what we're doing here is we're setting ourselves up to check successive elements in the array y. So in words, in really informal language, what this for loop does, what this while loop does, it says while ever the ball is above the ground, I'm not interested, check the next element of the, of the array, why? Is that above, is the ball still above the ground? Yes, it is, not interested, go to the next. Is, this, is the ball still above the ground? Yes, it is, I'm not interested. Is the ball above the ground? No, aha. So the while loop drops down to the line below it, it breaks out of the loop. As soon as we've found a, an, a, an, an array a loop variable i for which the ball is below the ground. In other words, the while loop stops as soon as we've found the first of these heights that are below ground level. And when we've done that, the index, the array index i, is the smallest index for which the height is negative. Because the index will be negative for all these values. That the, the, rather, the, the height will be zero for all these indices. We're interested in the first of them because that's the, our best estimate of the, of the, of the, of the um, time at which the ball crosses the, the ground. And so what happens is the loop terminates as soon as we've found that, that corresponding um, index. And then the corresponding time is the element of the array T at that index. So what I've done for you here on slide 19 is zoom in to the, the time around which the ball trajectory passes from above ground to below ground. And the index i, when I run that code, when I run this code on page 17, when I run that code, the index i of the first element below ground level the first element below ground level happens because of the particular physics of this ball trajectory and the choice of parameters. It happens for index 917. And I can check that because if I check what the height is at 916, the height of the ball is positive, it's above ground. If I check the height of the ball at time at, at array index 917, the ball is below the ground. So somewhere between these two time indices, the balls pass through the through ground level. That's great, but we're one step away. We're not actually interested in the array index i. We're interested in the time t because our original problem was to find this was was to estimate how long the ball's in the air, and we decided to do that by finding the smallest time where the height was negative. Not the, not the array index of the smallest time, but the smallest time. So we're not actually interested in, in, the, uh, in the actual uh, index or the height before or after. What we're interested in is the time corresponding to index 917. So if I go back to the code here, the absolutely crucial thing I want to draw your eye to in this code is that is about halfway down, there's a print statement and on the right hand side, buried inside the format is T square brackets I. That's the time instant corresponding to the index where the ball has just dropped below the ground. It's not a perfect calculation of um, uh, the ball height, 
it'll only be true to within a millisecond or so, but it's good enough for, for, for our problem here. If I was going to set this as an, as an assessment problem for an assignment, for example, I'd be more precise about how accurately I wanted the answer presented. And there are more accurate methods of finding, of finding the height, but that's pretty good. It's close to, to, to within a millisecond. So let's run it now. So again, I'm going to bring up, um, I'm going to bring up the GitHub repository. Here's the code. I'm going to cut and paste that into the console. What I would really do if I was working on this program, um, in, in, intending to expand it, I would not cut and paste it into the console. But there it is. I'd, I'd work on a program, but there it is, cut and paste into the console. If I run it now, it produces the curve for me, which is great. It estimates and it prints the time on the screen. Sorry. Presentation mode. If I then um, run that, can't do it here. Go to the console and cut and paste the code. There we have. It's estimated that the time of flight is 0.917 because it's. It's out here where the, um, let's do that again. Good. And so it's, it's, it's shown us that the, um, the, the crossing point out, out here is um, at about 0.917 seconds. And I can do that. What I'm actually going to do is a couple of things. I'm going to. That's right. Okay. Um, I'll do it from the console. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to plot. Uh, I'm going to repeat the plot command because what I want to do is zoom in on the um, that'll plot y as a function. Okay. That plot function will produce a curve, but I, I, I want to produce it with a with a line marker that's a star, an asterisk, because I want to see um, oh, I should have done this in a program. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's create a new program and cut and paste. I should have done what I said I was going to do. I'm going to create a new Python file. And I'm going to go to GitHub, find the code, paste it into my program, and then run the program. Okay, all good. So that's that. That looks good, and it looks like the time that it, the crossing here is if I if I use the cursor, it happens at about 0.916 seconds. That's about right. Let me go back in and change the plot command to change the line marker. I deliberately didn't put the uh, the screen in console mode because I'm uh, in presentation mode because I'm not interested in showing you the code. All I've done is change the line marker. If I now zoom in on the on the crossing point and zoom in again, here you see the line markers crossing from positive to negative, and it happens at a, at uh, this point, which is the first point in time. Um, this is index. 917. Excellent.
audio. Let's go back to the back to here. So I think I've made all those points. We've we defined our problem. We came up with a solution. I showed you the code. I zoomed in on the the code fragment that does all the hard work. And this is the this is the first. You can see why we need an iterative solution here, because we don't know in advance. In fact, it's more than just why we need an iterative solution. We need a solution that that uses a testable condition rather than a for loop. Because we don't know in advance what how many uh, data points we're going to need to process, we want to work along the array one point after another, one array element after another until we find the the, the crossing point. And as soon as we've found that point, we want to break out of the while loop. So this simple example is an example of the more general structure of a while loop. So we've the more general structure here is on page twenty nine. It says, while some condition is true, execute the lines that are indented. Notice how similar it is in, in the overall look and feel to the for loop. We've got some condition at the top, the header. This is the while loop header. We saw the for loop header before. That, that loop header terminates with a colon, and the colon is the way of saying to Python, get ready. What's going to come up is some indented code that you need to execute multiple times. The code lines are then indented and they're indicated here in the um, squeeze between the left and right um, angled parentheses. Those lines are executed as long as the condition satisfied uh, and then we drop out once the condition's not satisfied. In many ways very similar to the for loop that we've already seen. Indentation four spaces, once the indentation's reversed, the loop body's ended and the code drops through. And you've already seen a great example of that here. The, in, the, the indented code runs for as long as it, the condition is, is true. And as soon as it's not true, it drops through and does the printing and plotting. So this is a really common um, programming uh, template that you'll see. Iterate, iterate around until some condition is satisfied. As soon as the condition is not satisfied, drop through and continue executing the code. And we've shown that. And I don't need to go through that because that's an explanation of what we've already seen. That's a summary of what we've already talked about in words. One little um, uh, cautionary note before we finish with our while loops uh, is that unlike a for loop, while loops have got the ability to um, run forever. I'll say forever in inverted commas because they'll only run for as long as the power is supplied um, or as long as the computer program is otherwise operational. But nevertheless, they're called infinite loops because it's possible to have a while loop in which the condition never evaluates to false. Think about that. With a for, with a for loop, we run until we've exhausted the list of array indices. With a while loop, we run until the condition is not satisfied, or a condition um, it, we run until the condition is not satisfied. Depending on the code inside the block, it may be that the the condition is never evaluates to false. It may be that the code never escapes the loop. In that case, it's referred to as an infinite loop. Now there are applications where infinite loops are deliberate. It may be that you'd like to set a program running that runs until power's turned off or some other external action happens. Um, you might be using Python, for example, in Eng1500 to write the, the code for a, a line tracking robot. You don't want to run the, the program for um, um, a, a, for, for a thousand iterations, you want to run it until someone picks the robot up and pushes the off button or the reset button. So there are good cases where you use infinite loops. If you had a system that was running a surveillance camera, for example, you might want to run until someone turns the system off. Um, quite often, uh, infinite loops are, are unintentional and they're a really common programming bug. 
that's uh, introduced as you're developing programs. Um, inexperienced and even very experienced programmers uh, introduce infinite loops unintentionally. If that's the case, and your program runs and it's you think it should take one second to do some calculations and it's taking 10 seconds, you can press control and C and, and break out of the infinite loop. So um, I mention it because I can almost promise you you'll see infinite loops. Uh, I can almost promise to you that if you do enough uh, programming in this course, you will see infinite loops unintentionally. And um, they're, they're fun. Um, they're fun to debug. Uh, you need to be able to break the code. Control C will, will do that for you. Okay, pause. We're looking at three things in this morning's lecture. We're looking at uh, iteration, and that takes two forms, for loops, while loops. For loops run for as long as there are elements in the array, in the list of array indices. While loops running until the condition satisfied. Those two ideas are super powerful and you will use them repeatedly in this course and they are uh, um, absolutely central element of getting computers to do useful things and solve engineering problems. The third type of coding pattern I want to see you uh, introduce today for you is what's called conditional execution. So up until now, even including the examples we've seen earlier this morning, the code has had a certain pattern. It's run from the top to the bottom. Through for loops and while loops, we've now got the ability to run code multiple times. But every line of code will be executed and then drop through to after the for loop or the while loop. Branching and conditional execution is um, is something something different. And it's not used instead of for and while loops, it's used as well as for and while loops. Um, and we're gonna illustrate it with a program that helps us decide whether we should go swimming or not. And I'm taking this book example straight from the textbook and our, our swimming advisor is gonna be based on the water temperature in degrees Celsius. And uh, full disclaimer, um, I'm a winter swimmer, so the numbers in this, example do not apply to me um, but they're a good illustrative example um, of of uh, a program that uses conditional execution and I'll build it up in stages and what I'm also going to do here is uh, illustrate for you how a programs built can be built up in stages it, it's I'm gonna, always the case that for non-trivial programs, you've already seen it yourself. If you've answered that um, some or all of the questions in last week's, uh, in the weeks one and two uh, lab sheet, you'll see that even solving relatively simple problems is something you wanna do in steps. And you usually get a really small program to work first, and then you add features or you, enhance its functionality and you build up from the small to the large. That's an idea that's that's really common. It, it, it extends well beyond this course. It's a, it's a feature of, um, of uh, engineering design or now analysis. Try and understand a really simple problem and then add complexity. And our complexity here is going to be additional lines of code. It'll be additional functionality. So here's our first swimming advisor. It's uh, the simplest form of uh, the, the use of the, the Python command if. And it's done here in three lines of code that you see at the, uh, on, the, on, on the screen here now before you. The first line asks a, a question at the, at the console, what's the water temperature? And then converts that to a floating point number. So we haven't, um, depending on how, uh, you, you may or may not have seen this construct before where uh, there's this call to float input or maybe you've seen int input. If you haven't, no worries. If you have in weeks one and two, great. Um, the input statement 
gets input from the console. And I know I mentioned that early in the piece. We don't make a big deal of the input function in this course because once programs get anything more than tiny programs, uh, it's for, for solving engineering problems, it's rare that data would be entered at a command line. What it's normal to hap normally happening is the data is entered from a, a graphical user interface or more, or more systematically from a file. Now we haven't talked about getting data from files and I'll push that for a couple of weeks yet, but I, I do want to need to be able to run code from the console here. So there it is, the float input command or combination of commands takes a, a number typed in, a string of numbers typed in at the command line and converts them to a floating point number. That's not the if statement though. The if statement follows afterwards. If t is greater than 24, colon. So here we've got another use of a colon for a, uh, for a conditional repeated execution. And then we've got indentation again. So we've got a, even though it's a, we've never seen the if statement before, it's got features that we have seen before. Use of a colon to, to mark the, to, the start of some indented code. And so this code is, is, is the simplest possible example we could, um, we could imagine with if. It tests a condition. Notice that it's a, another one of these conditions that involves comparing a number with another number. In this case, the relational operator is the greater than sign. I'm just gonna see if I can type this in quickly into the console so I can give you a, a demo. I know you can't see what I'm typing at the moment. I'll bring it onto the screen once I've typed it. Actually, no, I won't, I won't illustrate that one live. Okay, so the um, one of two things happens. Depending on the number that's typed in at the console, if uh, one of two things happens, either, either the number is, is greater than 24, meaning 24 degrees Celsius, or the number is not greater than 24, it's less than or equal to 24. So if t is greater than 24, the program displays a message, great, jump in. What happens if the number that the user enters is not greater than, tw greater than 24? What happens? Well, the code drops down to the text indicated there in green in comments, the first line after the if. So it's implied what gets executed if t is greater than or equal to 24, but it's not actually explicitly written. So this is our simplest example of the if. If a condition satisfied, do something, do something in this case be print a command, print a, a print statement to the to the console. If t is not greater than, if, if t is greater than, if t is less than or equal to 24, the print command is not executed. So while this is only a three line code fragment, it's the first time that we've seen in this course that we've got a line in our program that may not be executed depending on the value of a variable at the time the test is made. What about, what about um, let's expand our program a little bit and now explicitly say what happens if the water temperature is not greater than 24. Namely, if the user enters a number which is less than or equal to 24. So can you see the difference between these two code examples? This one says what happens if t is greater than 24. This one says what happens if t is greater than 24 and what happens if t is less than or equal to 24. So our print, our swim advisor, says that one of the two following strings is displayed. Either, great, jump in, if the water temperature is greater than 24, nice and warm, or don't swim, it's too cold, if the water is less than 20, less than or equal to 24. Now those two conditions are mutually exclusive. The water is either greater than 24 or less than or equal to 24. 
So precisely one of those conditions, two conditions must be true. One of them must be true. Both of them cannot be true. So they're what I call mutually exclusive. One of them happens and only one of them happens. So we can actually rewrite that code on 25. We can rewrite it. And in order to rewrite it in Python, we need to use um, an enhancement of the if of the um, uh, the code. In fact, I've just seen a bug with this slide. It says we can simplify code with if elif, not true. It should be if else. So we've seen, um, so that's a bug there in the notes and I'll fix that later. It should be if else, not if elif. Um, what's the water temperature? We import it from the, the command line. If t is greater than 24, we print great jump in. Else, print do not swim too cold. So here the else statement is picking up what should happen in the program if the water is not greater than 24. So this code fragment that you see in front of you now on page 26 is how you write code that caters for what are known as mutually exclusive conditions, where one condition is satisfied or another condition satisfied but both of them can't be true. If the water is greater than 24, great jump in. Otherwise, or else, do not swim if the water is too cold. So that's really handy. To think about it um, from an engineering example. Uh, if the truck loading on the bridge is, is less than 30, 30 tonnes, execute some code. Else, meaning else, the truck on the bridge is 30 tonnes or more, then we need to take some sort of action with our, with our monitoring or our simulation program. If the pH of the fluid in the, the liquid in the tank is greater than 10, then take some action. Else, meaning the pH is less than 10 or less than or equal to 10, um, we take some other type of action. So if and if else um, are, are really powerful because they allow us to to, to execute code conditionally. Now the conditions here are really simple. They're just simple print statements. We're gonna see as we progress through the course where there are um, um, more sophisticated pieces of code that can be, that can be executed if, um, if the conditions are satisfied or not satisfied. Here's um, our final enhancement of the um, of the, uh, of the of the swim advisor example, we're going to um, enhance our program to not just say swim or don't swim, but we're going to and, and so it's not going to be a threshold of twenty four alone. There's going to be three types of water temperature. There's going to be water above twenty four, which is great jump in. Water between the temperatures 20 and 24, which is not too bad, but check the water first. Otherwise, it's too swim, don't cold. Uh, it's, do not swim, it's too cold. Joy, I want to draw your eye to a couple of things here. We started with if. We then introduced the keyword or the function of the keyword else. And now we're introducing the third keyword, elif, which is a shorthand version of saying, else if. So the way you'd read this code is if the water, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll use a really informal language. If the temperature is warm, great jump in. Else if the water temperature is moderate, that's okay, it's not too bad, put your toe in first. Else the water is really cold, don't swim because of that. So this L if is short for else if. So if we check in condition, if that's not satisfied, we drop down, maybe a second condition satisfied. If it is, do we will print else is our sort of catch all at the bottom. The other thing I want to, that, that, that gets executed. So notice nowhere does it actually say, talk about temperatures below 24. That's implied by this else that happens at the bottom of the, the bottom of the code. Then the other, the final thing I want to, um, uh, draw your attention to is this 
use of um, the less than or equal to here. Else if 20 is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to 24. That's interesting. It's been able to test two conditions in one line of code. We should run it after all that, shouldn't we? Got a few minutes left. Let's let's run it. Uh, have I got a few? Here it is. Here's our swim advisor. If so we enter we enter a number at the command line. If the temperature's warm, we jump in. If it's in a range, we say not bad. Otherwise, or else, don't swim too cold. So let's run it now. Let's run our swim advisor. So we're now down at the um, at the command prompt. What's the water temperature? Let's start with 25 degrees, nice and warm. We look at the code. That satisfies the first condition. Great, jump in. Notice that because it executed the first line of code, it, it skips over the rest and drops down to line 11, the first line after the if, else if instruction. That's because the first conditional was satisfied because T was greater than 24. Let's run the program again. What about water temperature now? I'm gonna try 24. 24 is within the limits of this testing condition two. So the code runs from the top. Is T greater than 24? No, it's not. Because this T, 20, this T greater than 24 is a strict. Is it strictly greater than 24? No, it's not. It's equal to 24. So it doesn't satisfy the first condition, but it does satisfy the second. So we would expect not bad, put your toe in first to be displayed. That's what we expect. Sure enough, that's what happens. Let's run it again. Run the swim advisor. What's the water temperature? I don't know, let's choose 22. Right in the middle of the band here of the, the second condition. So the first condition is not satisfied, but the second condition is. Again, not too bad, put your toe in first. Let's run it one third and final time, or fourth and final time. Run the swim advisor. What's the water temperature? Let's say the water's 17 degrees. Let's make it 15 degrees. Middle of winter, merry weather baths. Water temperature is 15. It's not greater than 24. Else, is it in, does it satisfy condition number two? No. Nope. Else, it's our sort of, our fall through condition, our fallback condition, don't swim too cold. So we're almost done and we're almost out of time, which is good. In general, the uh, if, elif, else um, construct looks as you see it on the, on the screen here now. If the primary condition satisfied, number condition number one, execute the code in the first indented block. Else if, elif is the, is the shorthand form in, in Python. Elif, a second condition satisfied, execute some code. Maybe that's not satisfied either. What about condition number three? What about condition number four? And if all those conditions fail, only then is the code in the else block executed. So depending on whether you, um, on what problem you're solving, we'll look at some more exotic examples on Thursday and beyond. Um, this is a really powerful construct. It allows us to, to write code, solve engineering problems, which uh, represent different scenarios and that we write code that captures those scenarios. And then if, the, if, if those scenarios don't apply, namely the conditions aren't satisfied, then what happens in that code block is irrelevant. It's only when the, con the specific conditions are satisfied that the associated code blocks are executed. So, 
really important lecture today. We've now got the ingredients at our hands to be able to, to get computers to do the, the thing that they're best at, doing lots of calculations and doing them iteratively. For loop is when we have a fixed number of iterations. While loop is we keep iterating while ever a, a logical or a Boolean condition satisfied. That might take one second, that might take a millisecond, that might take an hour to, to, to produce a result that means that the condition's satisfied or drops through. Or rather, an hour until the condition is not satisfied because we keep iterating while ever the condition satisfied, so we drop through if it's not satisfied. And then branching with if, elif, and else, where we've got the, we've got the ability to execute blocks of code represented by indented code blocks conditionally. And, and there's like a hierarchy of complexity here. If a condition satisfied, execute some code. If this one's not satisfied, but then be explicit about what happens in the second scenario, and the if, elif, else, certainly in its most general form, allows us to cater for all sorts of scenarios. Wonderful, so we are at the, uh, the two hour mark. So with that, I'll um, wish you all the best. There are some great examples in the week three lab sheet that became available this morning. Um, urge you to keep getting your hands on code, running, working through those examples with your tutors, both face to face and online. Um, until Thursday, when I'll see you next, I'll say bye for now.